Thanks so much, Rob. Hi, everybody. My name is Laura Palmero. I'm the Program Manager for Accessibility uh, on the Chrome team. Uh, and I'm Alice Boxall. I'm a software engineer on accessibility on Chrome. Great. We're really excited to be here today to talk with you all about Polymer 1.0 accessibility. First off, when we say accessibility, what do we actually mean? Just adjust this. So accessibility refers to the design of products, services, devices, and environments for people with disabilities. So one in six individuals has a disability. This is 15% of the global population, uh, about a billion users. So this is a really substantial amount of people, a significant statistic. But disability really impacts us on a very personal level. To give you a little bit of insight into my personal story and my experience with disability, um, I am what's considered to be a low vision user or a legally blind person. Um, I have a really rare visual condition called choroidal osteomas. Essentially, that means that centrally, my vision is very impacted. So if you can imagine, everything peripherally um, is quite clear. Um, I'm able to navigate around and, and walk without assistance, um, but everything that I look directly at, sorry, excuse me for one moment. <laughs> Thank you. But everything that I, I look directly at um, is really impacted. So it's a mixture of blur, um, distortion, almost if you imagine like a funhouse mirror effect, and then little flashing lights that kind of pulse all around. Um, this happened really unexpectedly when I was 14 years old. Uh, within one week, I actually went from being, you know, having 20-20 vision to being legally blind. Um, and this was a big shock to me. Um, it was a huge period of transition for myself as well as my family. Um, Quite honestly, when I first started, I was, you know, I was just about to enter high school, um, and all of a sudden I was entering school again, not being able to read a blackboard, or to read a book, or honestly to even distinguish faces walking down the hallway. Uh, this, was, this was big, this was a big shock. And I would come home from school at night, and my parents and brother would literally read to me, because my materials weren't available in other accessible formats at the time. Uh, my dad taught me all of my math classes after school because the teachers couldn't quite figure out what to do with a student who couldn't visually see the blackboard. Um, in my opinion, this was the definition of disability and dependence, and I quite honestly hated it because I was just a 14-year-old girl and just trying to fit in and be normal, um, and this really stopped me. And I, I'm so overly thankful for that amazing amount of support from my family. Um, I don't know where I'd be without them today, but. Uh, that wasn't going to sustain for, for me, and that wasn't going to be how I could move forward on my path. So over the next few years, um, my vision kind of continued to shift a little bit, and I did recover a tiny little field of vision in my left eye that remained centrally. Um, I can see about three letters at a time or so, to give you a sense. So actually, to give you a glimpse into my world and what I see, um, I, I heavily rely on using a mixture of all of my different senses of, of vision, um, whether central with that tiny little field or the peripheral vision to kind of piece together every image and every environment. So if I wanted to take a look at the beautiful canals in Amsterdam, for example, I'm going to go ahead and pull this up on Google Image Search. And my typical method here would be to zoom in on the page really expand the content and use that flexible UI to be able to then use that little tiny field of central vision that I have as well as the peripheral vision to put together the image the best way that I can. So, you know, we can all be looking at this picture and not all of us are going to see it the exact same way. But the really important thing is that the UI is flexible enough to allow me to customize it so that I can then see it the best way that I can. Also, to give you another little glimpse, this is how I use Gmail, actually. Um, so I use a mixture of um, screen reading support, so text-to-speech software, um, contrast adjustments, as well as magnification. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom on in to the, the level of, con of uh, magnification that works best for me. And then I see an email here from Alice. So I'm going to go ahead and open that. And then I'm going to highlight the text. Hey, let's meet up tomorrow and practice our talk. I'll bring the stroop waffles if you bring the coffee. Then I can go ahead and respond. Sounds great. And now I can dream about coffee. So this, this solution and this assistive technology has literally transformed my life. Um, thinking back to when we first kind of discovered all of this, when I was entering college, uh, we would literally take um, physical books and textbooks 
and strip their bindings off. We would high-speed scan the pages, then convert them using OCR software, put them into an electronic format, and then I could use this text-to-speech and magnification to make it work for me. So by no means was this process pretty, but it completely changed my life, and it gave me that independence back. Um, and it was at this point that I realized the tremendous impact that technology can have on people's lives. Um, and it has driven my passion into accessibility ever since. So let's talk about some of the users who might be needing assistive technology or requiring accessibility in design. So we could be talking about users like myself who are low vision, um, or perhaps people who are fully blind, who rely on full screen reading software or braille. We could be talking ap about people with hearing impairments or who may be profoundly deaf, who rely on screen captioning or sign language. We could be talking about people with motor impairments or dexterity impairments. Maybe it's hard for them to use a physical mouse or to use a keyboard. Um, they may rely on speech recognition software um, or even a virtual keyboard or switch controller. Or we could be considering people who are neurologically diverse, so perhaps somebody who has dyslexia or autism, and maybe they need to have a little bit more support on their screen of keeping focus or maybe even using text-to-speech software. We could even consider people in situational impairments. So for example, somebody who just you know, broke her arm uh, and can't type for the next three months. What do you do then? Um, and lastly, I definitely urge everybody to think about the aging population. Um, as technology is more and more heavily used in everyone's day-to-day -day lives, um, as people get older, they may experience some slight deterioration of vision or hearing. And they're going to expect that their devices are going to be there to support them throughout their life and throughout the phases um, very se seamlessly. So this is a lot of different, um, different use cases. And disability is a really broad spectrum. So when you're designing, by no means are we saying that you have to individually test for each and every single use case. Um, but we want to kind of expand what we're talking about here today and think about how we can actually design um, for the most group, the highest amount of people at once. Um, so from, the, from now on in this talk, we're actually going to focus our efforts on talking about guidelines um, that can help us through accessible design. Uh, and we'll also talk through the process that we followed for enhancing Polymer 1.0 accessibility. So for Polymer 1.0, the Polymer team really wanted to create a set, of, uh, a set of elements that they could stand behind in terms of their accessibility and their usability by a really broad range of users. So we created a checklist that would allow us to sort of capture a bunch of best practices um, that we could run over each, each element and sort of give it a sort of, OK, this is our best effort at making this accessible. And this checklist is based on the Web Components Gold Standard, which is available publicly on GitHub. Uh, the Gold Standard actually includes accessibility just generally throughout the checklist, as it uh, makes the position that accessibility is just part of any complete custom element. But we've just here pulled out the accessibility-related items and grouped them into a few categories that we sort of like keep in mind as we're going through and sort of like make sense to kind of bundle together. Great. And to give you a sense of our process that we took leading up to the Polymer 1.0 launch, uh, we created this the spreadsheet tracker, and this is just a small snapshot of it. And we used these guidelines that Alice just mentioned to test each element individually. And as you can imagine, leading up to the 1.0 launch, um, there was a lot going on, a lot of moving pieces. And we had to figure out how to prioritize accessibility within this broader scope of work. So we helped to prioritize on two axes. So first, how critical was the user issue? And second, um, basically, how high traffic did we expect that that element would be comparatively? Great. So to walk you through our process that we took to test for accessibility, identify issues, and then resolve the issues, we're going to take you through a quick case study of the paper checkbox element. Great. So let's start with the keyboard. So here, go ahead. here we've got the traditional experience with the mouse pointer. So I can go ahead and use the mouse pointer to hover over these checkboxes, to go ahead and click to check or uncheck them, and I get a nice little animation. It's very smooth. But now let's take a look at the keyboard experience. What if this user can't really use a mouse? They need to use the keyboard only. So in this early demo, I'm tabbing through. 
but getting no, no sort of visual feedback. So I really don't know where I am on the screen. You may have heard some little dings in there. Um, that was me trying to press enter to activate one of the checkboxes. Nothing was working. So major fail. This is not going to work. So what actually went wrong here? So we're missing focus. So we're also missing focus visibility. And it's not keyboard interactive. So I can't actually use or activate the checkboxes with just the keyboard only. So breaking those items down one by one, taking a look at flexibility. So by comparison, we have just a native checkbox here, a couple of native checkboxes. This is sort of trying to recreate the experience where you filled in a credit card form, maybe a flight booking. Um, if you're me, you're going to go through with the keyboard, fill it out really quickly, not even touch the mouse. Um, because I just, yeah, I know my credit card details and whatnot, get to the end and I'm going to check the, yes, I read and agreed to the terms and conditions checkbox because I've totally done that. And then I really need to make sure that I uncheck this please spam me every day checkbox. So I can move focus there and uncheck it. So very, very simple, something we're probably all familiar with, but to break down those concepts, we have uh, those checkboxes are focusable. I can move the keyboard focus there. And I feel like I'm sort of circularly defining focus here, but the focus and the focus ring that you see there are kind of a promise that you can do something with this element using the keyboard. So in the case of like the credit card field, I could cut, type my credit card details into it. Once the focus moves down to these checkboxes, I can check and uncheck them with the keyboard. The way that we make uh, custom elements focusable is by using the tab index attribute. So tab index can take one of three sort of ranges of values. Uh, if tab index is zero, that's going to put it in the natural tab order, so following the DOM traversal order. So this is just exactly the same as you would get with a native checkbox. If tab index is negative one, it's going to be programmatically focusable, but you're not going to be able to get to it using the tab key. So this might be uh, a piece of modal UI or something like a, a menu item where you want to actually have control over when focus gets to it rather than just having the user stumble across it in the tab order. If tab index is greater than zero, it's going to be in a manual tab order. So you get to specify any sort of index in there. Um, all of those elements are going to come before everything else in the tab order. This obviously makes very little sense on the outside of a custom element because you don't know where your element's going to fall in the page by definition. Um, it is scoped within Shadow DOM, but if you don't know whether or not you're going to be in Shadow DOM, again, it really makes no sense to use it. So this is kind of something that you really want to mostly avoid. In the case of paper checkbox, actually making it focusable is really straightforward because we have this host attributes object. So host attributes is going to be applied just after the element is created, but it's also going to respect any value that the author, the web page author, has provided for that value. So in this case, we could take a paper checkbox and I could say, no, I really need this paper checkbox to be right up front in the page. Give it a tab index of one, it's going to appear before all the other elements in tab order. So that's working as expected. So once you've made something focusable, it's absolutely critical to make sure that you can tell when it's focused. So I've actually seen uh, developers do all the right things and add all of their custom keyboard event handling and make things focusable, and then have designers come in and say, we're not a fan of that focus ring, turn it off. And what this looks like to a keyboard user is that they have just thrown them under a bus because they can't tell what's going on. They can't even tell that focus is getting to the element that, you know, that they may be able to do something. So it's absolutely mandatory to make focus visible in some way. So if you are forced to turn off that focus ring, you can obviously match the focus style. Uh, and in a custom element, you would probably want to match that on the host or wherever you've put the tab index. So in the case of a uh, complex custom element, which might have multiple focusable things inside of it, you would obviously match those. In this case, I've just created like this silly toy element with a star. Um, and I'm going to say, OK, make the background color for that star span, this nice polymer blue. Um, and yeah, then I'm done with that. For paper checkbox, it's actually done a whole end round around the CSS focus styling system. And it actually uses its own custom paper and key focus behavior, which gives it that nice ripple, it makes it a really consistent experience with using a pointer. So it's going to look just the same whether you're using a pointer or focus. It's going to yeah, be a really nice experience. Once we've addressed the focusability and the visible focus, then obviously we need to fulfill that promise that we've made by making it focusable, by making it actually do something when you use the keyboard. Keyboard event handling in HTML is not great, um, but luckily Polymer T 
team have provided iron accessibility keys behavior, which you can mix in. So this is going to abstract away all those gnarly cross-browser differences and legacy and spec mismatches and whatnot and give you just a simple syntax for defining key combinations and their listeners. So again, with my wonderful little star element, we've got a import for the iron accessibility keys behavior. behavior. We're adding it into the behaviors list. And then I'm going to add this key bindings object, which is going to define which keys I'm listening for and what happens when those keys get fired. So in this case, I've left it up to your imagination what's going to happen when you press space or enter. All right, so let's take a look at the fixed experience now. So now we're able to tab through, either using tab to go forward or shift tab to go in reverse. Get a really nice, clear visual focus, which is that gray circle. And I can use the enter key to actually check or uncheck the checkboxes. See, that wasn't that hard, right? <laughs> All right, so next, we did extensive testing with screen readers. And screen readers are used by people with visual impairments to navigate the UI purely using audio. And for the next moment, I'd like to invite you all to just briefly close your eyes. All right, so let's take a look at the paper checkbox now using Carbon, screen reader. uncheck, checkbox. Hydrogen, check, checkbox. Nitrogen, check, checkbox. Great, you can open them if you choose. <laughs> so that was the smooth experience of what, what a user should be able to navigate. So basically, this, this user, I'm able to navigate using the keyboard, hearing the audio of what the checkboxes actually are for, um, what state they're in, and I can then infer that I could use the enter key or the spaced key to then change them to either check or uncheck them. This is great. All right, just to give you all a sense of some of the free screen readers that are available out there. Um, so VoiceOver is available on OS X and iOS for free, it's built in. The NVDA screen reader is free and open source, uh, available on Windows. Uh, we've got the ChromeVox screen reader on Chrome OS, and we've got TalkBack on Android. There are plenty of others out there available for purchase. You may have heard of ZoomText or JAWS or others. Um, we did our testing for the Polymer 1.0 launch and beyond um, across a multitude of screen readers, as well as browser and OS combinations, because we wanted to make sure to be as comprehensive as possible. So now let's take a look at an experience that isn't so great. Group, 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 group. Super helpful, right? So if you're non-visual, what are you getting from this? Nothing. Um, I'd be really confused and honestly just angry, and I'd walk away. So what went wrong here? So we have no semantics that are properly declared, and we have no labels. We have no clue what's going on or what we can do with this UI. So taking a look at those, uh, um, those items one by one, first up, semantics. So again, comparing and contrasting with a native HTML checkbox, we're going to yeah, just add a checkbox in the page. And that gives us this nice visual rendering, which to anyone who can see it, gives you some semantic cues. So we know, for example, that this is going to be something which takes a Boolean type value, it's on or it's off. Um, it's probably going to be choosing one in a list of options, or it's going to be answering a question like, yes, please spam me for the rest of my life. Uh, we also get this DOM object that allows us to programmatically interact with, that, with the, the element on the page. What you probably may not have seen before is that it's also going to translate into a node in the accessibility tree. The accessibility tree is what screen readers like um, VoiceOver, which we were demoing just before, or many other screen readers or assistive technologies actually interact with rather than the visual UI, which is painted, painted on the screen. So in this case, we have an accessibility node with a role of checkbox and a value of one, meaning checked, uh, and some other attributes. It's got a role description. It's, uh, which is going to be localized. It's got an uh, invalid value saying it's not invalid, it's not, uh, it's not disabled. So that gives us like a bit of an overview of what semantics we can actually express. We can, we can give an element a role. So this is obviously really critical for um, any interactive element. We need to know what type of interactions we're going to be able to do with it. It can take a value, so is um, a numeric value or a text value. It can take a state. So checked or not checked, but also things like disabled, has pop-up, and any other type of properties. So things like for a slider, you might have a minimum and maximum value, which is not really a current value, but it's, it's just a property. 
So going back to our paper checkbox example, we've got, we've, just as we did with the native checkbox, we've entered the paper checkbox on the page and make, made sure that it's checked. Just so with the native checkbox, we get this nice visual rendering, which gives us some visual cues as to its meaning and semantics. And just as with the native checkbox, we get this great DOM object that we can manipulate programmatically because Polymer provides this really nice API for us. But the accessibility node that is created by default from this element is basically non-semantic. It has no meaning. The browser is just going to say group. So this is, this is why in the demo a moment ago, it was just saying group, group. So the browser saying, I don't know what this is, which is really not great for accessibility. The way that we can address this in custom elements is by using WAI ARIA, which stands for Accessible Rich Internet Application, which allows us to specify those roles, states, values, and properties via plain HTML attributes. So the way this might look uh, if we didn't build this into the paper checkbox is that uh, as an author, I could come along and give this custom element a role of checkbox and an ARIA checked value of true. So it's still going to look exactly the same. It's still going to uh, have exactly the same API. But now, to a screen reader or assistive technology, it's going to look identical to that native checkbox, because it's going to have the same role and the same value in the same state, which is exactly what we want. Uh, and again, this is very straightforward to do in a Polymer element. So in the paper checkbox, we just add it into the host attributes uh, object again. And again, this means that as a web page author, I can come along and say, OK, I know you say you're a checkbox, but I'm going to pretend you're a radio button. And to a screen reader, it would say, OK, yes, great, that's a radio button. And we're also going to give it a default ARIA checked value, and then keep that ARIA checked value in sync with the actual live element state. Great. So now we've declared some semantics. Let's take a look at the experience now. Uncheck checkbox. Check checkbox. Check checkbox. OK, so it's a little bit better. I know if the checkboxes are checked or unchecked, and I know that they are checkboxes. <laughs> but what am I checking? Uh, maybe I really want that spammy newsletter. Who knows? So, all right, so what do we do from here? So this is why labels are so important. We have a bunch of options in native HTML for providing labels. And wherever possible, we should try and use those, because they'll always provide sort of extra benefits. So we've got the label element for anything which is labelable according to the HTML spec. We've got alt attributes for images. And most things can actually use their textual content as, an, as a label as well. ARIA also gives us some options for labels. So ARIA label will allow us to specify a non-visible label um, for something like an icon button where the, the actual meaning comes from the icon for a sighted user. Then you don't need to provide uh, an actual text label but you can provide an ARIA label to replicate the experience of the icon. And ARIA labeled by allows you to take a visible piece of UI, which may not be part of your descendant content, and say, OK, this is acting as my label. So for paper checkbox, we're actually using the ARIA label op option. Great. So let's take a look at the positive experience one more time. Carbon, uncheck, checkbox. Hydrogen, check, checkbox. Nitrogen, check, checkbox. As you all can tell, this is a vastly more accessible experience for a non-visual user. All right, the third bucket um, of the guidelines that we're going through today is making your UI more flexible. So three things that we wanted to cover um, are ensuring you know, redundant color, um, sufficient contrast, and magnification. So first, redundant color. Um, did you all know that there are 315 million people out there who are colorblind? Uh, that's roughly the same amount of people who speak English as their native language. Um, this is a really large amount of people. We need to be considering them in our design. So the main purpose here is that we never want to use color as the sole way to actually identify key information. So we're going to take a look at the, um, the gold email input element for a quick, a quick review of this. So right now, we've got an email entered below. Um, which is basically an incorrect email. And right now, in the early stage of the demo, uh, the only way that this is signified is by the red color in text and the underline. So if, if I were a colorblind user, or for me, being someone who just has difficulty detecting color, um, this actually looks just completely normal to me. So I might be going through and filling out a form and just continuing to hit this error, hitting submit, and getting really frustrated because it's just not letting me know. So the Polymer team then gave um, one step up, which is 
basically allowing you to enhance the thickness of the line, just to say, hey, like, there's something wrong here. But again, if you can't say that that thicker line is also red, it might just look like a styling change or a formatting change, so it's still not overly clear to the user. The best option is to utilize what the Polymer team has provided in custom error messaging. So this way, you can actually show whatever, whatever wording you need to show about, oh, there's something wrong here. Um, this is really clear to all users whether or not they can perceive color or cannot. And it can be used as the label for the screen reader to then tell a non-visual user of exactly what's going on. So we can just flash up the fully accessible version, so showing color, but also the thicker line and the actual wording. So next up, we've got contrast. Um, and it's really important to ensure that you've got sufficient contrast between the text or an icon and its background color. Um, so the WCAG accessibility standards basically say that the absolute minimum contrast ratio that we want to consider is 4.5 to 1. The only time when this doesn't really apply is if you're using large text, so size 18 font or larger, um, and this, you're, the minimum is actually 3 to 1. So definitely want to consider these standards um, across all of your design. I can give you all a real life example. Uh, on my flight over from San Francisco to Amsterdam, um, this was the screen that I experienced on the plane, so when I was choosing movies. And for me, this was really difficult. I couldn't actually read any of the texts. Um, so I wound up just fumbling with my remote control, and I came across Pitch Perfect randomly. Wound up watching it a few times. Don't get me wrong. Pitch Perfect is fine. It's cute. But that was really unnecessary. Um, and some of you we experienced out in the overflow room with the bean bags. Um, we noticed that the, the big, beautiful windows, they're letting in a lot of light, and it's actually making that screen a little bit harder to tell. So some of you may not even be able to see the text, which is you know, a real-life example of illustrating the point that here we've got a contrast ratio of 2.9 to 1, which is far below the 4.5 to 1 recommendation and, and guideline. So in case you're not able to calculate contrast ratios in your head by looking at color pairs, um, the Accessibility Developer Tools extension, which Chris mentioned in his talk earlier, um, as well as allowing you to audit for contrast ratio of text, actually provides a debugging tool as well. So if you can see it, there is an um, extra sidebar pane in the Elements panel here. And I'm just inspecting some text on just a regular HTML Google results website. And I found some low contrast text. And the extension is going to tell me its current contrast ratio is 3.95, which is low, um, and give me some suggestions for darker shades of gray that I could use. And Chris also mentioned that the same um, audit rules that are in the Accessibility Developer Tools extension are built into the Polymer testing library. So I've got an example here of some accessibility testing for the paper checkbox, no, paper radio button element. Um, so they've written some custom accessibility tests, but all of the accessibility audit results there are coming straight from the audit. And it's, all of those passes mean that this check was relevant to this element and it passed, so that's really great. Great, and lastly, we want to make sure that magnification is working smoothly. So if I need to zoom in on the page, I want to make sure that all of the content actually still renders correctly. So here we can see the paper checkbox again. And I'm utilizing just the Command Plus on Mac, or if you're on Windows or Chrome OS, uh, Control Plus to zoom all the way in. And I can see that you know, the, the formatting still stays really well intact. Um, I'm still able to use the Tab key. The focus still remains. It's in the right place. It's a really smooth experience. So we definitely encourage you all to quickly check how, how your elements and how your sites and apps are rendering um, when magnified or zoomed in. So that's about where we are. Where to from here? If you're using the Polymer Elements, obviously you have the option to use the Paper Elements, which is going to give you the full material design experience and also um, the up-to-date accessibility experience. So the accessibility is sort of, sort of a, like perpetual work in progress, but it's just going to keep improving as time goes on. The Iron Elements give you the more basic behaviors, so you can use the reusable mix-in behaviors. So things like um, the checkable behavior or even the, the sorry the accessibility keys behavior, um, but also bare bones elements that you can build on top of, like there's sort of a bare bones list element that you could use. Uh, and if you're wanting to start completely from scratch, the li Polymer library obviously gives you some accessibility support as well with the keyboard mix-in, the host attributes object, 
and the automated testing built into the polymer testing. Great, and here are a few um, additional resources that we recommend that you all check out. Um, so first, the gold standard accessibility checklist that we mentioned, available on GitHub. Um, the material design usability guidelines, really helpful. And also some of the automated testing tools. So for instance, the accessibility developer tools audit that Alice mentioned, which is available as a Chrome extension. So if you just do a quick search for any of these terms, um, you'll be able to get more information and learn more. So to wrap up, uh, the World Health Organization made a statement that really resonated with us. So they said that disability is really the interaction between individuals with health conditions and then their personal and environmental factors. So this is when real barriers are set in place. So if somebody's in a wheelchair in this building and really needs to get to the second floor, but the elevators are broken. Um, or thinking back to my early days in my math classes where I was sitting in class and just couldn't get the actual context because there was no other way of receiving that information aside from visually reading the blackboard. So the incredible thing about technology and all of the advancements that have been made over the last years is that these barriers simply don't need to exist. I think about how now I can customize my entire experience um, really to my needs and assuming that the site or the app is actually built in an accessible way my visual impairment doesn't have to hinder my experience at all, and I can do whatever I need to do, albeit slightly differently. So we hope that you've all found this talk informative and that you now include accessibility in your design and development and help to make a more accessible world. Thank you.